upload on this computer. We are recording and I've got the rubric already. So I am good when you are and excited. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Raheem Robinson I'm from the Cayman Islands, as you probably know already. And today I'm going to be speaking on why I think everyone in this class should visit the Cayman Islands at some point in time during their life. So if you look at the visual aid, it's a map of our three islands. Uh, at the top are the full Cayman Islands, with Grand Cayman obviously being the biggest of them all, and Little Cayman and Cayman Brac to the right of us. On the bottom is the main island, that's Grand Cayman. So that's the one that I reside in. And if you see my arrow, I live in the capital, which is Georgetown. That is where the financial center is, the tourism industry is mostly conducted in terms of the operational stuff, the ports, the airport, the cruise ports. Uh, so most of the stuff happened on the smaller area of the island, which I think is fascinating because it's about 50 to 60,000 people and we're all within 12 to 20 square miles. So the Cayman Islands has all the top firms in the world. Uh, one of our strengths is our banking system. And according to the Cayman Islands Monetary Authority, which is our regulator, which would be the SEC in the United States, uh, the Cayman Islands are home to some 120 plus banking institutions and over 10,500 mutual funds. And for anyone who is not quite sure what a mutual fund is, think of it as a pool, so a mutual group of people that put together their monies and trade it on the stock exchange to generate their revenue or their return on their investment. So here you can see this would be the building for the world's biggest accounting firm, PwC, PricewaterhouseCoopers. And in the middle, you'll see a few of the employees of Price Waterhouse Coopers. Now, from my experience in the industry, I know most of the people in this picture, and uh, most of them are non Caymanian residents. So as you can see already, uh, the big firms around the world, and they bring a lot of people to the island who you know, move here on a work permit, and they work here, I think it's up to nine years for one single permit, and then it needs to be renewed. But one of the big things in Cayman is corporate social responsibility. And I think that's what uh, a lot of the people that come to this island like is that when they are in these companies and they have the budgets that these companies have, they have the opportunity to give back to the island and do uh, responsible acts or deeds. So, for example, we do a lot of charity walks, a lot of charity runs. We do a lot of uh, meals on wheels type associations and organizations where we help you know uh, impoverished parts of the island or just in general everyone and on the last picture you'll see congratulations we couldn't be more proud one of the focus that our governments have for all the companies that do come to the Cayman Islands to operate business is that they give back to the island in the way of scholarships and grants to students who want to pursue higher education so here you'll also see continued KPMG, which is another one of the top four accounting firms. And similarly, picture of their building here, some of their community initiatives, and again, another group photo with them, most likely. I actually attended this event with another company. This is something too that we do, which was like a fun sports day, you know, all kind of different sports and stuff. So it's really a big community driven uh, country everything is small, everything is close-knitted. So the opportunity to meet and commingle with everyone is definitely an advantage in my opinion. Um, here is a picture of the first financial district in Georgetown. So Georgetown is the capital and this is most likely where all the top financial firms are based or were based up until a certain point in time, which we'll get to as well. This is a new development Kamana Bay, which was spearheaded and is about a 20 year project from our local investor, DART, 
who's actually one of the richest people in the world or one of the richest organizations in the world, I should say. And they have pumped in billions of dollars to sort of create this work, live, home, shop, town, within a town. And a lot of the big companies are starting to move into these areas. As you can see, there's a really nice, you know, island. And the idea is that yachts will come all the way in, park right next to their firms that they go to do business with. And it really kind of brings back that culturally relaxed Caribbean tropical environment and feeling. Uh, so you can see people just in and out of the shops and walking and at the same time that you're watching a movie in this area, your kids can be playing outside in the water fountains and it's just really a nice relaxing area. It's one of the prides of Cayman and I think a lot of companies want to get in here just because of that fact. Um, so one thing that I wanted to show you guys, there's an individual named Matt Brown who did sort of a a video or a, a music video just kind of highlighting the relaxed vibe of the Cayman Islands. So I'll play that just for a few seconds so that you kind of get the gist of what Caribbean people are sort of used to and like as a way of life, um, if you don't mind. So I'll bring it up. It's X1071 Radio, Blake and Aaron, live from the beach. We got a brand new track for you. Matt Brown, Ben Hud, Rum Point. Check it out. White sand, blue skies. We're having a good time. However, you came by plane or by cruise. This is for you. This is for you. Take it to the party. I got the rum. We're chilling on the beach. Sipping pina coladas. I'm such a bum. I'm falling on my seat. Swinging on my hammock, going left and left and right. Swinging on my hammock, going left and left and right. Swinging on my hammock, going left and left and right. Swinging on my hammock, going left and left and right. We up in the Caymans, all the police. So that's somewhat the vibe that Cayman sort of represents. And it's really just, you know, relaxed and a lot of people come here for the relaxed feel and the environment as well. So what makes the Cayman Islands very special? One of the things that we pride ourselves on is that we're a very tourist oriented destination. And according to the website Statista, international tourists have flocked to the Cayman Islands in growing numbers each year. For example, the number of international tourist arrivals in the Cayman Islands as at 2018 was reported to be 4.63 million. So here you can see just some pictures of our island. This is mostly the Georgetown area. We normally typically house around six to seven cruise ships on a busy day. So this isn't really a busy day. Um, and then you can see our water and our beaches. And yeah, I think, it's, I think it's something that really attracts a lot of people. Obviously, Americans are used to the Bahamas or Hawaii, but I think that in the Cayman Islands, it's more of a diverse uh, feeling and group of people that you'd commingle with. For example, there's the Caribbean, so you have a lot of Spanish inhabitants as well. And then we're a British overseas territory, so you'll also get the UK feel and we do a lot of business primarily in the financial services industry with Asia. So you get that sort of Eastern Asian vibe as well. So it's definitely diverse in culture and experience. Here's the statistic that I was referring to earlier. So as you can see over the years from 2005 to 2008, we've been steady for a while and then all of a sudden it's just boomed up. We don't question why, we just accept I accept it and, and roll with that. Turtles. So one of the other things that I think makes Cayman unique is that we have the only official turtle farm in the world. And our turtle farm is also used to sell turtle meat and we grow our own local turtles as well and farm our own local turtles, I should say. So this is actually pretty neat. This was a facility that was 
uh, established four years ago. And as you can see, the turtles just kind of roam free in the water. And there's also certain parts in the park where you can hold the turtles up, you can feed them, you can play with them, etc. cetera. Uh, some of the other attractions for Cayman are Stingray City, all the way to your left. This is pretty unique because the stingrays sort of just stay in this area. No one really knows why. We think it has to do with, you know, the treatment from the natives back in the day, and they just kind of come back to this area all the time. It's sort of like a sandbar. So it's a large area where you can just stand in the water. You play with fish and stingrays, and people normally bring their boats out. So you can see a yacht and a catamaran and we will barbecue and drink and just be in the water and play with, with stingrays. Also to your right is a place called Starfish Point. This is a little bit more relaxing and I think people just go here to kind of wind down from going to Stingray City. And then all the way to the, to the right is Rump Point. This is Stingray City without the stingrays. So people are still in the water and they're just having a good time with their boats. Everyone brings their boats out on Sundays and we sort of just have this kind of fire. Um, we sort of kind of have this like network of, of people just on the water having fun, you know, and like I said, there's a restaurant right there as well called Rum Point Restaurant Bar and Grill and people can order food, et cetera, and we drink and we have fun and we're in the water. So I think that's actually pretty cool. Most people look forward to that on Sundays throughout the week. One of the other things that we've been getting involved with more being in the Caribbean area is the Soka Carnival season. It's definitely something that we consider a part of our heritage. And I know, Professor, when you had sent around the playlist I struggled for about five hours trying to find a song that my classmates would understand. So I don't know if you guys actually understood the words to the songs on the playlist, if the playlist has actually been um, disseminated as yet. But yeah, I hope you do and I hope you enjoy it. There's a lot of different culturally artistic songs in the soca genre that I think you guys would love. So Another thing other than Soka is our culinary uh, environment as well as our events environment. So we have a Cayman cookout and we have a Pirates Week. So I don't know if anyone knows, but back in the day, Cayman was one of the ports to call for the British Navy. And literally what you see on Pirates of the Caribbean, we were one of the destinations that would have housed such activities, you know, like uh, having forts and basically just having sandy beaches with treasure stuck in the bottom of them. That was the Cayman Islands for a time. Even as we, we, we do this Pirates Week every year and every year it's sort of, it's literally two, well, it's two weeks. So it's a week for the kids and then it's a week for the adults. The week, the, during the week, for each week, we do sort of a district cookout in all of the different districts. So in the Cayman Islands, there's five districts. There's Georgetown, there's West Bay, there's East End, Bodden Town, and North Side. And in each of those districts, everyone has their sort of spin on the food that they, that they make. So each day, each district will host their own day of food, along with the Pirates Week kind of finishing off with like a big, uh, how could I call it? Sort of like the carnival um, parade. So it's like a parade of carnival trucks and the dancing and how you saw everyone dressed up just now. That's what we do on the Saturday and the Sunday. And in this Pirates Week parade, we also have like a pirate ship that we use and replicate uh, sort of the acting out of a pirate battle. And um, one of the things that we, that I wanted to mention to you guys is that according to the Cayman Compass, even as we lost our prized pirate ship that we used to use during the festival, according to the Cayman Compass article, it may have lacked some of the flair from the past years since we didn't have it. 
but the energy level of the sneering, snarling raiders, spouting threats, threading with far more errs than any other letters in the alphabet seemed just as potent as ever. So one of the things I wanted to just take away from that is that regardless, I think it's a concept and a way of life that we live by is that regardless of what happens, we try to make the best of any situation. Um, and that's one of the things that we established through our Cayman kind uh, sort of unhidden laws of our land. We have something that we call Cayman kind, which just kind of means, you know, we just treat everyone with the sort of respect that we want to be treated with culturally, emotionally, uh, you know, physically, any, any way you want to put it. And since this whole presentation is about why I think you should visit the Cayman Islands, one of the other quotes from the same article that I wanted to mention to you was from a person named Nick who was visiting from London. And he basically said that when he came to enjoy the event, it was his first time ever visiting with his friends in the Cayman Islands and it happened to coincide with Pirates Week and he really enjoyed it and he really liked it. So I think that's something that you guys should look into and maybe visit the island during our next carnival or parade. Just a few things to mention about the Cayman Islands. So our leader is of course, the head of state is Queen Elizabeth II, who's represented by a governor, which actually lives in the Cayman Islands. And then we have a premier who handles the day-to-day -day government of the island. And the premier is Alden McLaughlin. He became the premier in May of 2013, following the success of his party overall, which is the People's Progressive Movement. And he was sworn in, sorry, he was sworn for a second term in May 2017 after forming a coalition government within the Cayman Democratic Party after inconclusive elections. Here are some more kind of key dates in our history. One of the important ones on this that I just wanted to point out is that in 1962, we had the chance to declare ourselves independent. However, we decided not to, and we continued to stay under British rule, which I believe overall was a very, very smart thing. I know everyone likes independence, but in terms of our economy, we function mainly based off of two sectors. We function on tourism and we function, function on banking. So without those two, we don't do any other sort of farming to a large extent to sustain a full economy. And I think that staying under British rule was a very smart uh, thing to do. Our currency is very strong. So I think it's $1 CI is $1.20 US. And uh, yeah, I would implore any of you to visit the Cayman Islands, especially this time of year, because it's summer. Well, it's summer here all year round, but during the summer, it's really nice. So thank you very much. And I hope you guys enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. Yay. Okay. Um, give me two seconds and we will jump into Brian. Okay, um, ready? Wait one second. Sure. Alejandro. Well, I'm ready when you are. Okay, hello. Um, I'm going to speak about animal advocacy today. So I'm gonna start right. So, okay, so according to the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, like every year, almost 7 million dogs and cats enter animal shelters in the US. And of these, about one and a half million are euthanized. That's like 1,500,000 animals that will be put down by the end of this year alone. So this, name, this number is kind of mind blowing, but actually it's kind of good news because a few years ago it, it was almost over. So and besides that, 
these 1.5 million animals are actually the loved ones that made into a shelter where they have food and where they have safety from predators, cars, and the weather, and where they died in a relatively humane way. But there's also about 6 million other companion animals that are not so lucky and they die in the streets every year. So, um, just to make clear, euthanasia rates are not the shelter's fault. No one of the shelters enjoys having to put animals down. So most shelters have government contracts that bind them to accept like every animal that is found or surrender, regardless of the resources or place. So the actual problem is pet overpopulation. That's what I'm going to speak about. So according to a national database called Shelter Animal Count, there are about 70 million stray animals in the country. So in, according to the Humane Society, dealing with stray animals costs the U.S. Tax taxpayers around $2.6 billion a year. So it's an economical problem that's a challenge for every county and the budget. Besides that, from an environmental stance, abandoned pets are some of the most destructive invasive species. According to a paper published in the Smithsonian Magazine, cats alone are known to have caused the extinction of at least 33 species of birds and small mammals. And lastly, abandoned pets are also an ethical failure for society. So we have domesticated these animals, basically changing them beyond their ability to survive with others. And we breed them either to perform certain tasks for us, but more often than not, we breed them just to please us. And then we cast them off to fend them by themselves, by the millions. So we are responsible as a community for 6 million dogs and cats killing the streets every year, and the 1.5 million that are euthanized too. The good news is that there are some things we can do about it, and that's fostering, TNR, education, volunteering, and donating. And I will talk briefly about all of this. Fostering is when you provide temporal housing for a dog or a cat. Keeping an animal for a few weeks frees up cages in the shelter, preventing animals to be put down due to overcrowding. And fostering cats and dogs helps the shelter or rescue institution to know more about the pet's personality. Maybe if they are a good match for our dogs or if they will, they will be good pets for kids. This way, less animals are returned to a shelter because they were not a good match. Also, fostering animals helps, helps to socialize them. They get used to human company, schedules, and rules. And those res reduce behavioral issues when they get to a new home. And according to animalsheltering.org, a lot of animals adopted from shelters get returned in the first few weeks because the transition from shelter to home comes with too many adjustments, which is way less likely to happen if the animal comes directly from a foster home. And finally, fostering puppies or kittens literally means saving lives because young animals usually need care that the shelters cannot provide, like feeding every three hours or uh, aiding with temperature regulations. So very often shelters have like the difficult decision of having to eat on ice newborn animals because they don't have the manpower to take care of them. Okay, so here are a few pictures of kittens that were sick and they go, when they go to a shelter uh, here in Memphis and after they went into foster care. So by fostering, you are saving pets from being euthanized due to lack of space. You are raising them into being good social pets and you are helping getting families the right match. And finally, you also provide life-saving care. So most shelters will help you foster the animal until they're old enough to be spayed or neutered, because the main goal of all of this is to stop pet overpopulation, which takes me to the next point, maybe. That is TNR. This stands for Trap, Neuter, Return. And this is a common practice with feral cats, and it's the only humane way of keeping uh, cat populations under control. A review made by the nonprofit Ali Cat Foundation found that in communities where TNR is done regularly, the cat population can decrease by up to 60% over a few years. And to put the problem in context, according to the ASA PCM, sorry, a female cat can get pregnant since she's like four months old, and she can have three litters per year with around five kittens each. So of each litter either, only two or three kittens survive, which means that half or more will die. Uh, by starvation, predators, and infections. But even with this high mortality rate, if you do the exponential math growth, that means that a female cat and her mate and the offspring can produce 
11 million cats in nine years in several generations. Uh, with dogs, the number can be up to 70, 77,000 dogs in six years, um, six years because that's the average lifespan of a dog in the streets. So the only good way of preventing this is by spaying female, female dogs and cats and neutering males. Most of the time, uh, dogs can be adopted after being spayed or neutered, but cats that grew up with a positive human cotton are usually not fit to be adopted into a home, and we call them feral cats. The way TNR works is by trapping cats with traps, taking them to spay and neuter clinics where they are sterilized for free or for a small fee. Uh, once the cat is trapped and fixed, it can be returned to the place where it was trapped and it will not reproduce anymore. There are some picture of the Spain Memphis, that's Summer Avenue. That's a clinic that uh, neuter cats for a very low cost. Okay, and the next point is volunteering. Volunteering at the shelter is uh, also a great way to help reduce shelters. <coughs> uh, always short on hands. So for example, you can help by directing families to pets more appropriate for their needs or by socializing animals, taking dogs for a walk or whatever you can do. Uh, you can also help by feeding puppies or caring for sick animals that are overweight do not get the necessary care. Picture from volunteers at Memphis Animal Services. Um, another great way of helping is educating others. Most people, are, most people are not aware of all the problems and suffering that cause having a pet that has not been fixed. So just by talking about this with more people, so, so more people are aware that needles pay and neuter are pets. And finally, donations. As most shelters are always running low on food, supplies, and toys, so you can always help with whatever you can get. And in conclusion, we as a community are responsible for all the consequences and suffering that pet or population brings. But there's some there's always something we can do, and it starts by understanding the problem and having these numbers in mind. I hope I can get you all to consider fostering a pet or volunteering at whatever shelter you want or organization. And if you cannot, maybe just tell someone about it, about how many animals are euthanized, how many cats can a female cat have in their life. So information is power, and well, now that you have it, hope that she's what to do about it. And that's it. Thank you. I'm gonna stop sharing the screen. Yeah. Yeah, that button, and then it should pop up for both you and. Oh, you've got multiple monitors. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Hello. Hey. Cool. We can see it. We can hear you. We are Perfect. ready. All right. So, um, good afternoon, and I uh, really wanted to come to you today to talk to you a little bit about a growing trend that has occurred over the last, uh, well, several decades, um, and it's how globalization has changed our supply chain base in ways that uh, we probably never would have imagined before now, um, in a never-ending search for ways to reduce costs. Uh, to make things cheaper, faster. We've, uh, we've strung our supply chain lines uh, further than we ever imagined and have made them more intricate and more detailed um, than anybody really realized. It wasn't until January of this year when the lockdown occurred in Wuhan as a result of the coronavirus epidemic that we really started to begin to um, understand how big of a deficiency we had and how many single points of failure we had allowed to create uh, in our supply chains. And we've seen it play out in grocery stores and supermarkets and department stores all over the country and frankly all over the world. Um, it's time for us to re-examine that. It's time for us as a people to begin to understand what it is that we've done to ourselves and to understand that it's not too late to do something about it, right? Um, a return of manufacturing uh, back to the United States 
is really the direction that we need to head if we ever want to safeguard ourselves from future global crises like the one that we're currently experiencing with the global pandemic. This isn't an easy task. It's not something that we're going to be able to do overnight. After all, um, China didn't become the, the largest manufacturer of products in the world overnight. And uh, they have good reasons and they have lots of infrastructure to support what it is that they um, have in place. But we can win and we have to do it strategically and through some key areas, um, primarily uh, areas that involve healthcare equipment, pharmaceuticals, things that we saw uh, very early on that we don't need to have a long and very um, unstructured supply chain for. But <clears throat> my name is Nate Modine. I'm a supply chain major at the University of Memphis. And um, I'm going to show you a couple of ways that I think that we can, through investment and through time and our money, we can make change happen that's going to benefit our country and our people for the future. In January of this year, uh, a large percentage of Americans have probably never even heard of Wuhan, China, or the Hubei province in central China. Um, in fact, many manufacturers didn't even know how many things were being made in China. The Harvard Business Review uh, article that was published showed that a survey that took place in late January and early February, 70% um, of the respondents we're still trying to identify how many of their suppliers and how many supply houses were in lockdown areas of China. They had never done the mapping um, to understand outside of their tier one, their immediate suppliers, who are their tier two and tier three, like who supplies the supplier with the products that you need in order to manufacture goods and services. The, uh, it had not been done. And so everyone was scrambling to try to figure it out at the last minute. And uh, it's, it's played out, like I said, we've seen it happen uh, time and again, uh, where we're out of stock on items and, and important things, gloves, surgical masks, cleaning supplies, disinfectants, paper towels, right? Um, how did this happen? How did, we, how did we get here? Well, some of it is because of hoarding and people doing too much. Some of it is because of literally um, a poor job of planning and understanding that we had these multiple single points of failure uh, throughout. So with that being said, how do we win and how do we go about doing this? I'm not suggesting that we need to move all, uh, everything we've moved offshore back onshore. We don't, we don't need to get into consumer electronics and textiles and clothing and all of these things that are currently made overseas and done very well, but, but key areas that impact on the health and well-being of the people that live here in the United States needs to have a structure uh, and it needs to be a, a decoupling of the supply chain. We need to have more diversity in the supply chain so that we don't, under, we don't find out that we're going to fail because one city or one province in a faraway land uh, has something terrible happen. We need to make sure that we are using data and data analytics to make smart decisions. And we really need to look at uh, automation and how robotics and technology are going to help us be able to begin manufacturing back here, as opposed to, yeah, this isn't an argument for blue collar workers and bringing jobs. This is an argument for making sure that we have the necessary supplies that we need in order to be able to function as a society. And so um, keeping those things in mind, I think that that's, that's how we win. That's how we get after what it is that we're trying to succeed in and how we will be able to move forward. The, uh, China has long been known as the world's factory. In fact, um, in Forbes magazine, they were, it's reported that 28% of the global manufacturing is, is manufacturing made in China. It's not just the United States trend. Everyone in the world is dependent on China for manufacturing. And it's because they're centrally located to both the Eastern and Western hemispheres. Uh, they have a huge workforce. The labor is very inexpensive uh, in comparison to a lot of other places. And so it's, uh, it, it just makes sense. And this has crept up into our society over time, but not until this pandemic and the coronavirus hit have we ever seen such a, a global 
um, breakdown occur. We've had earthquakes in Japan. We've had flooding in Thailand. We've had numerous hurricanes and tsunamis that have wrecked economies and wrecked uh, individual countries and locations, but nothing ever on this scale. The disruption that that, that, call, that happened in China has caused a ripple effect um, that we're going to continue to feel throughout the rest of this year and throughout um, into the future. The effort to reduce the cost of goods over time has is, is left the, the West, has left, the, left us unable to produce necessities and um, it's time for us to make a change. If we really wanna win, these are the areas that we win, right? We gotta go after automation. We have to make sure that we're using smart technology, that, that we're taking the critical seg segments that I talked about in manufacturing and bringing those back using extensive automation so that we can run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and, and uh, produce the things that we need, like the things that we have shortages in now uh, in medical supplies and in uh, pharmaceuticals. We need to be able to make our own blood pressure medications and our own diabetes medications and the things that our people need to be able to, to get by. Um, decoupling the supply chain is not easy though. It's gonna take time and it's gonna take structure. Um, we need our supply chain to be more flexible. We need to have redundancy, continuity. Is, and I would just say that moving out of Southeast Asia uh, will allow us to rapidly deploy um, more of a, a, a digital footprint. It helps us manage our risk and it will lower the likelihood and uh, tendency of stockouts that occur. Lastly, data insights, using uh, big data and using um, the information that we're gathering, there's still a need in manufacturing to have people on the shop floor, right? It's not just about uh, virtualization and doing things through Zoom. It's about, um, there's still, a, but using the data and the insights to be able to eliminate and cut costs and to be more lean, even though we are uh, going to allow for more stock and more things that in the past we probably would have done without or tried to do without. So if you take a step back and you just think about what I'm telling you, imagine the future and imagine a world where the United States has automated, or I'm sorry, automated manufacturing, where we are building surgical masks and gloves and medical equipment that we need in case of, in light of the current situation, that if it was to ever occur again, we were more prepared than ever. A decoupled supply chain, meaning faster turnaround times, that products are able to get to stores within days as opposed to weeks or even months as it currently stands. And then ultimately data-driven manufacturing where we're connecting data and insights with people and, and being able to do things smarter and faster, a return to a, a more of a local market type of situation. Finally, it's our time. It's time for the United States to re reclaim the crown as the world's largest manufacturer. And it happens through your action. It happens through your investment, where it is you choose to put your money, where it is you choose to spend your money. And it happens through, it's not gonna be an easy transition, but it can happen and it will happen because business always follows where the investments go. And so we all have the opportunity to be the investor in this and we have the opportunity to make this change happen now. It's time, and, and I, I, uh, I just want to say, when we look back through the annals of history, this is a pivotal moment that we're standing in right now, and how we choose to act and how we choose to move forward uh, will we'll be talked about for years and years to come. Thank you. Yay! All right. So, up next, do we have, do I have anyone in the, no. Oh, I also don't have the next human. Hey, William, do you want to go early? I can if you, if you give me like th like two minutes. Sure can. I, I, I need to pull up your rubric anyway. Yeah, I was. Uh, that's why I need to. I need to send that in. 
to you. That's why I need oh, to. Oh, the you. outline? Yes. Yeah. That too. Um, but I do want to, uh, it's, I used the, the format, you know, or the template that you gave us. Um. And for whatever reason, it won't let me move it back up. Like it put the actual outline on the second page instead of right under the. Uh, Weird. But I, it, it literally won't let me move it back up either. I okay. don't know why. That's all good. It's a technology issue, not a you issue. So here I'm good. I just wanted to give you forewarning. <laughs> of course, yeah. <laughs> so I'm not like, wait, there is no outline. What are you talking about? Uh, okay. So let's close out Nate. Oh, wait, I guess you need to see me, don't you? <laughs> I do need to see you so that I can assess your physical delivery, which I'm being very generous on, by the way, for everyone involved, because it's so impossible to do this via Zoom. So I am totally ready when you are. Today, I'd like to talk about how uh, technology and scientific advancements have uh, improved athletics over the years. Um, Sidious Altius Fortius is the Olympic motto, and it translates in English to faster, higher, and stronger. And that's what athletes all around the world today, uh, that's the motto that they live by. Everyone is striving to become better or as best as they possibly can. And uh, due to the evolution of uh, sports sciences and technology, athletes are able to train and perform at, uh, in ways that athletes in the past were never able to do. Equipment and body mapping have played a major factor into this. Body mapping is basically where they take a visual map of your body and figure out where you need to, uh, or where the sweat, your sweating produces the most. That way they can uh, effectively um, stop you from sweating during uh, your physical exercise. Manufacturers uh, uh, within the last 30 years just started making compression uh, specifically for sportswear. Uh, that, way, uh, it, that way they can uh, help regulate blood, blood flow through your body and uh, your regulate body temperature as well. These are important things. Uh, you don't want to overheat or become too like cold while working out. Otherwise, uh, you can just hurt yourself. Basically, <laughs> um, sports science and tracking technology has also played a major uh, role in. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry. Public speaking uh, makes me nervous. Sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Sports sciences and tracking technology have also played a major role in the improvement of athleticism because we are now able to uh, track one's heart rate and their breathing. Uh, breathing machines where you can train on focusing on breathing properly and things like uh, that technology just didn't exist back in the, the early age, the early stages of sports, they just basically went out there and just did what they could until they dropped, uh, dropped down from exhaustion. They weren't prepared physically just because the technology didn't exist. Uh, specialized training also has played a big role in the uh, advancement so, stuff, such as like nutrition and dietitians. Uh, that nutritionist didn't start uh, discovering exactly what athletes needed to eat until around the 1940s, which, uh, and even then it wasn't an exact science as it is today. So it took several decades to um, basically hone, hone in on what needed, uh, what the proper diet is for someone who plays professional, uh, or plays professional sports. Training uh, in general has also become a lot more uh, specialized over the years. Um, a, a lot of times uh, when sports started, uh, everyone tried to play everything 
or and didn't really uh, hone in on one specific sport. Everyone wanted to play as much uh, as many sports as they possibly could, which in the long run hurt their bodies and affected them in the wrong ways. Uh, nowadays, uh, basketball players have uh, specific workouts that help them jump higher, and those didn't come around into the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, people just didn't know what to do until scientists and uh, sports scientists, I should say, uh, started to research it and discover what would help them the most. Uh, while it's often overlooked, recovery has come a long way in itself too. Uh, and a lot of people overlook it due to the fact just uh, everyone's too busy. They're trying to get on with their the next day of their uh, workouts. But if you don't recover properly, then you can end up damaging your body worse than what uh, worse than what it originally was. Uh, things like uh, hypo, hydrotherapy, compression therapy, and shockwave therapy have all been uh, are relatively new, except for hydrotherapy. It came out around in the 1800s, but uh, along the lines we've tweaked it to. Uh, do, uh, do what it actually needs to do. New innovations have just helped us, uh, have helped us speed up recoveries and cutting down time, uh, and cutting down time of recoveries also leads to uh, athletes being able to uh, stay out on the field longer. And a couple examples that I would like to show you that proves that uh, technology is one of the main factors that has helped athletes improve instead of just athleticism in general getting better are uh, Usain Bolt and Jesse, uh, well, Jesse Lawson, or Owens. Jesse Owens won the 1936 Olympics and the time, uh, or the, 100 meter race with a time of 10.2 seconds and in 2013 Usain Bolt won the world champions with a time of 9.77 seconds. The difference between the two was a 14 foot gap but in reality Usain Bolt just had better technology than Jesse Owens did. Jesse Owens ran on a soft surface made of wood and Usain Bolt was uh, running on a carpet uh, specifically engineered for running and Jesse uh, Owens had to dig holes that way he could have a starting block to kick off from and Usain Bolt had blocks provided for him that were specifically made for sprinting. It is estimated that if Jesse Owens had had all the technology that uh, Usain Bolt had to, uh, provided to him that the gap would have shrunk from 14 foot to one stride. Next is the longest distance cycled in an hour. The record was set in 1972 at 30 miles, uh, 3,774 feet. It was broken in 1996 when a more aerodynamic bike was released and it was, the record was dusted by um, a little under five miles, which in, when you're biking five miles is a, a lot of distance. The rule was later changed that if you wanted to break the record, you had to use the, equi the same equipment or something that was equivalent to that equipment to beat it. And now the record today is only 30 miles, 4,657 4, feet. That's only 883 distance, 883 foot, di foot difference since the original date set in 1972. So in 50 years almost, the, the record has only gone up by 883 feet, and I don't see anyone breaking that record anytime soon. And um, that's, that's all I have. All right. Thank you, William. I'm sorry. I, I just do not like public speaking. It's not, <laughs> it makes me nervous. So I apologize for the shaking voice. First of all, and normally you would have already had this interaction with me because we would have been in person previously, but first of all, I couldn't tell at all that your voice was shaking until you said something. Huh. 
So don't yeah. bring attention to it. You are doing totally fine. The second that you go, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I'm so nervous. Now I know, but yeah. I had no idea beforehand. So just like, you know, you're not supposed to repress stuff, but like stuff like that, just shove it down, shove it way down. Mm -hmm. Totally fine. You came off super confident, wonderful, great, engaging speech. Thank you. Don't bring attention to it. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. All right. So we've got two people in the waiting room that I'm going to admit. I will stop we can sharing. stop sharing your screen. Thank you. Yay, we have people back. Okay, uh, Bryant, um, do we have a microphone? I think so. Can you hear <laughs> yes! me? Uh, Yay, it worked! I'm so excited. Okay, so we're gonna have you are, sir. And excited oh. about lucid dreaming. Okay. Uh good evening, everyone. My name is Bryant Barnes. And I think that everyone should try lucid dreaming. Um, you know, say you're in a park and you're sitting on a bench and the grass is green and everything is so beautiful, the sky is clear and you feel real good. And you look to your left and suddenly you notice a pink elephant. And you, you say to yourself, a pink elephant? I must be dreaming. That is the moment that you get lucid in a dream. And suddenly, suddenly you, uh, you realize that uh, the laws of gravity no longer apply. Uh, you can fly. And what's, I would say, what's weird about flying in a lucid dream is that uh, you're not overwhelmed by the fact that you can do it. You instinctively realize it's like, okay, yeah, this is supposed to be happening. It's like, it's almost like remembering, you know. Uh, you can move objects with your mind in the dream. Uh, for 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 someone who who's never had a lucid dream, it may sound uh, outrageous, but when you're experiencing it, it's it's second nature. It's like you remembering how to do something from somewhere else, um, and you get access to knowledge uh, that is in your subconscious mind. Uh, for an example, uh, many lucid dreamers um, look at the sky in their dreams and ask their dreams a question, ask the dream a question, and they get answers. Uh, it is just uh, something that's it's almost unbelievable. Uh, we do dream every night, but a lot of people don't recall their dreams when they wake up the next morning. And um, many people, when you know, when when I'm asked about like how do I start to get to, to recall my dreams, um, it's best to keep a dream journal to so you can remember your dreams. Uh, the scientific evidence for for lucid dreaming, um, I would say, in the West, started with uh, Dr. Keith Hearn at the University of Hull uh, in the UK. Uh, he and Stephen LeBurge, uh, who was a doctor, well, he's still a doctor at Stanford University, conducted similar experiments. Uh, they were able to communicate with subjects who were asleep in the sleep lab by the subject uh, moving their eyes right to left to uh in a in a recognizable pattern that was agreed upon before they went to sleep so uh dr hearn um communicated with his subject alan warsaw uh 
while Warsaw was asleep in the sleep lab, uh, Warsaw was moving his eyes uh, right to left uh, to signify that I am communicating with you while I'm having a dream. So he was realizing that he was dreaming and was able to make contact with a person that was uh, in his immediate surrounding. Uh, my own experience, um, I became lucid. Uh, the, I think one of the first times I became lucid, I was driving home. Uh, I was dreaming that I was driving home uh, from Vicksburg. I was going back to uh, the Mississippi Delta, where I'm from, and I was in Vicksburg. So I was driving home. And um, for some reason, I pulled over the car, got out, and began climbing the side of a hill. And I asked myself, why am I climbing on the side of a hill? I must be dreaming. So from that point, I let go of the hill and started to float. And immediately I knew that I was dreaming. Uh, in that dream, I was able to move uh, vehicles with my mind. I was able to fly. <laughs> it's and do all sorts of incredible stuff. Um, lucid dreaming can be a tool for spiritual awakening, uh, to have a direct experience uh, with your subconscious. And um, many people meditate within the lucid dream and uh, they say the, the results are magnified, you know, where it, it, it would take you much longer uh, to reach a certain spiritual level while you were conscious. Uh, in other words, whatever you do spiritually, when you do it in a lucid dream is it magnifies it times 10. If you meditate in a lucid dream, it's like 10 times of what it would be if you were awake. And um, to remain passive uh, while you are lucid in a dream and just let the dream take over, uh, they say that that's the best way uh, to do it. I have not uh, done it yet personally because I was, you know, the times that I've been lucid, I was so interested in flying and moving objects with my mind. It was just hard for me to just sit in one spot and meditate and just see what would happen if I didn't do anything at all. So based on that, I think that everyone should try lucid dreaming. Um, it's uh, definitely uh, a tool to awaken the spiritual part of the self. Uh, the scientific evidence that supports that it exists, uh, it's totally safe. Uh, millions of people do it around the world and no one's ever got hurt from a lucid dream. Thank you. Thank you. I am ready when you are. Okay. Right. Did you know that the giraffe population has declined by 40% in Africa in just 30 years? According to the African Wildlife Foundation, in the late 19th and 20th centuries, herds of 20 to 30 animals were recorded. Now on average, herd sizes contain fewer than six, six individuals. Giraffes are one of the first animals we grow up learning about and seeing at the zoo. There has never been an instance in our lifetime where giraffes did not exist. With the way things are going, there could come a time when future generations never get to experience the majestic giants that we know so well. They're essential to the ecosystem, similar to bees. When they graze, they help populate plants, making them necessary in the growth of greenery in Africa. Habitat loss is one of the main contributing factors to this drastic decline. There should be laws in place to protect giraffe habitats. 
Habitats are in animals' homes. Their homes are different from ours as it has everything they need to live within it. When these habitats get destroyed, it leaves the animal vulnerable and unable to survive. All giraffe decline, all giraffes have declined, but some giraffe species are more endangered than others. There are four species of giraffes and five subspecies. With the development of habitat conservation laws, we can help alleviate some issues facing the giraffe population decline. To get started, let us look at the issue facing giraffes. The giraffe population has been on the decline for a while now. Some species have reached the endangered category. The four species of giraffe are the Maasai, Northern Reticulated, and Southern giraffes. The Cordofan, Nubian, and West African giraffes are all subspecies of the Northern, and the sub Southern giraffe subspecies are the Angolan and South African. Three out of the four species of giraffes are considered endangered, with some species considered, some subspecies considered critically endangered. According to the Giraffe Conservation Foundation, Maasai giraffes have declined 50% in the last three generations, resulting in them being listed as endangered on the IUCN Red List. The Cardofan and Nubian giraffes are critically endangered with a decrease of 80% and 95% respectively. The West African giraffes have moved from endangered to a um, too vulnerable, but the numbers are still relatively low. The reticulated giraffes have oh. the reticulated giraffes have declined 50% in the last three generations and are endangered. This decline also varies from country to country. Research from Agutu states that between 1977 and 2016, there was a 60 to 70% drop in northern giraffes in Kenya. Humans play, humans play a significant role in the decline, accounting for a major portion of habitat loss. Humans impose on giraffe homes by creating infrastructures and even taking, li taking livestock to graze in them. A quote from Q states, adding to pressure is exponential growth in mining and infrastructure development, highways, railways, oil pipelines, and industrial compounds, which often encroach on key giraffe habitats, including those in national parks. People raising livestock have overworked their land, so they move to places giraffes inhabit, and it creates a competition of food. Acacia trees are the primary source of food for giraffes. When giraffe lands get overworked, acacia trees will not be able to grow, leaving the giraffes with nothing to eat. Research has shown that the increase in livestock have, de de have demonstrated a correlation to the decrease in wildlife, including giraffes. Agutu also states the most salient features of the trends were a striking increase in numbers of sheep and goats and camels and concurrent extreme declines in numbers of 14 of the 18 common wildlife species throughout Kenya's rangelands between 1977 and 2016. Giraffes are one of the 14 common wildlife species mentioned. To combat the issues, laws need to be made to make it illegal to impose on giraffe habitats. The legislation will be called the Wildlife Conservation Act. It will state that building or grazing livestock on land inhabited by wildlife will result in a fine of $5,000 for the first offense and and a one to three year prison sentence for the second offense. If a law like this is created, it could convince people to leave wildlife habitats alone. Uh, even if the actual law does not deter them, then the consequences of someone else could be an example of how serious this issue will be taken. According to how laws are made, and according to how laws are made and how to research them, the first step in getting a law passed is to contact your elected officials and they can write it as a bill. The idea is the, only the first step and the real goal is to get it passed. As a result of the proposed solution, there should be an increase in all four giraffe species in the wild. 
This solution will not only help with giraffe conservation, but also help crack down on another issue giraffes face. Because, of ha because the habitat loss would no longer be a factor, more attention can be placed on the other problem, poaching. Some more benefits of having habitat loss is that the plant life that giraffes pollinate while grazing will not be lost, and future generations can, ha can have giraffes around in their life as well. What you should take from this is that giraffes are extremely at risk for extinction, and laws to protect their homes are a good starting point for conservation and expanding their numbers. You may be wondering how you can help. A great way, a great way to help is to inform people you know about this issue and to go to your elected officials to get the ball rolling. We are starting with giraffes, but this can change the lives of all animals. Thank you. So we've got wonderful. Okay. Here we are. Okay, cool. I okay. then am ready whenever you are. Oh, you had the same issue. Was it I think it was William that like had a weird format. Yeah, it was William that had a weird yeah, format. Yeah, whenever I like I wonder if it's the template. I don't know. I have no <laughs> idea. It was like a struggle and I was like, forget it. It's yeah. like Totally there, fine. So. I'm glad that you didn't spend too much time on it. Um, I won't get into that. This has never happened to me before. Yeah. It's okay. changing um, the font color and stuff, too. Uh, no idea why. But. Okay. So, my persuasive... Do you, oh, wait. I can't see your screen. Did you share your screen? Um, I thought I did. Ma'am, are you fine? I have no idea what I'm doing. Can I just like go on without it or? Um, so there is, a, there are points associated with the visual aid. So you, if it's entirely up to you, if you want to go on without the visual aid, then um, that's fine. You just won't get the points for it. Um, if you want to spend another minute trying to figure out how to share your screen, up to you. Mm. I guess I'll just go on. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm ready then when you are then. Okay. Um, so my persuasive speech is about creating laws to ban the ownership of exotic animals, specifically tigers. My inspiration was the documentary Tiger King, um, as many of you may have seen. Um, I actually live in Oklahoma right now, and I actually visited there for my birthday this year without knowing what exactly was happening and so I want to bring awareness to what I saw and um, what I have researched about and hopefully ban the uh, issues and bring to light the issues that have evolved. So um, there's a lot of reasons as to why you shouldn't own a tiger, you know obvious reasons common sense um, but there's a lot of things that go along with owning a tiger, the care, the housing, food, diet, all of those types of things. Um, tigers have very specific diets. They need a lot of meat every single day for their meals. Um, and housing, they obviously need big spaces to roam and large spaces so that they do not feel entrapped. Um, a lot of times whenever they are in small enclosures, they tend to pace, which is a sign of distress. And um, when I was there at the park, they were pacing all, all over the place and none of them seemed comfortable. Um, but whenever the proper care is not provided for these animals, they end up getting malnourished or have illnesses or are stressed without having the proper diet and care that they need. And a lot of states don't keep record of people who own exotic animals. And so that is another reason why this becomes an issue is because no one knows who has these animals. And that is obviously a danger to society. 
Um, there's some states that completely ban the ownership of exotic animals. And then there are some states that require licensing or permits to do so. Um, California and Massachusetts have really strict laws regarding the ownership of animals and a lot of the other states should model their laws after these states. Um, there are some states that do not have any sort of laws requiring or permits or banning the ownership of them. So um, the you would think that it would become a federal law and there is a Endangered Species Act that is a federal um, level act that has been in place, but it is hard to enforce the laws in the federal way. So that is why they have most states or local cities have specific laws. It's easier to enforce a state law than it is to enforce the in the federal aspect. Um, and so a lot of the concerns that are, there's public safety concerns regarding the ownership. Um, one is people either get tired of them, can't afford to keep taking care of them, or have others some kind of personal issue and so they want to just release these these tigers into their neighborhoods communities wherever they may live which then obviously turns into harming the public um and then it ends up usually having like a standoff or like a hunt for these tigers because you know they don't want them to start attacking people so then that that puts their life in danger when they had no part in like a, they had no say in being owned and being held captive. Um, another one is if you do properly, you know, take care of your animal and, you know, keep them in a cage or whatever, they could possibly escape and hunt down livestock, people's animals or people in general. And so then that would end up them getting hurt or a human life being endangered as well. Um, and then there's also the issue of, like I mentioned, um, the proper care for these animals. Zoos and sanctuaries are, are the best places for these animals to live and be held if they are going to be in captivity because they can do the research and have the funding to provide for them. Um, and so, um, I lost my train of thought. These tigers and exotic animals are, should not be held in captivity unless they are in a zoo. Um, even zoos sometimes have attacks or have to put down the animals that become euthanized, but overall tigers should not be held in captivity. And so this is why we need to like push our legislation and get laws in place so that these tigers aren't suffering. There's more tigers in captivity right now than there are in the wild. And that shouldn't be how it is. It should be the other way around. Um, and so there needs to be more laws in place like California and Massachusetts have that, um, ban, prohi like prohibit the o private ownership of owning these tigers. Um, otherwise, if there are states that have like permits or legislation saying that you can get a license or have a permit to own them. There's still ways that they can be harmed or they can harm others. And um, so, yeah, I think um, that, I guess what I'm trying to say is, um, we really need to focus on the exotic ownership of animals in our country because this can then lead to 
public safety and public harm. So, yeah. All right, thanks. Oh, these are so good. I was in such a grumpy mood earlier and now I'm so jazzed. There we go. Oh shoot, let me go back to the other inbox, Dropbox. There you are, Matthew. Oh, another MMS. Okay. I am officially ready whenever you are, sir. Okay. We'll get started then. Jogging your brain, improving academic performance by running. In order to succeed in life, God has provided him with two means, education and physical activity, not separately, one for the soul and the other for the body, but for the two together. With these means, man can attain perfection. That was stated by Plato, a Greek philosopher, whose philosophies have set, helped set the foundation of Western civilization. And also uh, he was known for creating the academy or one of the first universities in existence. So is physical activity really that integral and important to academic success and success in life? Well, there was a young man in Manhattan in the early 80s who had just graduated from school and uh, was kind of drifting with no particular purpose in life until he decided to change his life. He started running three times a day and began to turn his life around from that point forward and pursue his passion of becoming a community organizer and later decided to pursue his dream of working in the White House and ran for president and became the 44th president of the United States, Barack Obama. And he did not slow down the intensity of his exercise and work ethic. The LA Times reports that as he was running for president, he continued his exercise routine and even intensified it and prepared the White House for his new gym. So today we are going to preview and look at some of the challenges that are facing college students these days and look at how there is a better alternative to the study methods that many college students are using an uh, alternative to cramming and the simple exercise that you can start today you see, by becoming an active runner, you will increase your brain power and academic performance. So let us begin by examining the pressures that are facing students today. College news reports that uh, students are feeling increased pressure in high school to get into college. And in that competitive environment, the stress and pressures are building up both before college and once they are in college. The American Institute of Stress reports that students are not getting nearly enough sleep because of the amount of pressures that is put, put on their shoulders. Eight in 10 college students experience frequent stress, college news reports. And to fight back on these different pressures that students are facing, they attempt to cram. You see, rather than um, having a long study plan, they end up pulling out all-nighters and trying to 
study all through the night and cram as much information in as possible. But uh, Hawkeye, which is a student newspaper, reports uh, that half of respondents to a survey that pulled all-nighters uh, said they consumed caffeine to keep awake. And nationwide researchers estimate that 30% of college students across the country use stimulants known as study drugs. And all this effort to pull all-nighters is not productive. The BBC reports that what is familiar is not necessarily remembered. And what they put into their short-term memory, 80% of that is usually lost. So let's begin to look at a better alternative to facing the stress and pressures of college and examine exercise and see how exercise can improve academic vitality. There was a study done in the Journal of Neuroscience on mice where they separated two, uh, two groups, well actually four groups of mice, the young and the old, and they had sedentary mice and mice that were put into physiological activity to see what happened between the different groups. And what they found was that both the learning and hippocampal um, neurogenesis uh, were enhanced in these running mice. The hippocampus, of course, is a part of your brain that is associated with long-term memory and helps to take those memories and uh, infuse them into you. And so that part was enhanced in those mice and they experienced neurogenesis. Now, exercise also increases blood flow, which encourages neuroplasticity. There is a growth trigger protein known as BDNF, which augments existing health, existing neurons, and helps create new ones. It's kind of known as like the miracle grow of the brain. And during exercise, that, that is triggered throughout the brain and released so that it begins to flow and help the brain get empowered and get more circulation, blood circulation, to help the neurons. So from that point on, I want to look narrow in specifically as to how the academic performance is affected by physical activity. The Center for Disease Control actually did a study where they took a whole bunch of different studies uh, about 43 articles with 15 unique studies after uh, examining a whole bunch of articles to try to figure out how physical activity improved academic performance. And they broke academic performance down into three different categories. They looked at how it would sharpen cognitive skills. Of course, cognitive skills being attention, concentration, memory, and verbal ability. And then, of course, they looked at academic behavior, attendance, time on the task, homework, and so on. And then finally, academic achievement, which is the actual grades on standardized tests. So as they looked at these articles, they found many positive correlations between physical activity and the academic performance of the students. They found, of course, that the positives that were happening during uh, exercise in the brain, such as um, the production of neurofins and the growth of nerve cells and new neurotransmitters, were having this positive effect. In fact, I'd like to share with you a picture of how the brain looks during exercise versus being sedentary. The brain, the image that you see on the left side is of a child sitting quietly. And as you can see from the blue areas, that represents low neural activity. Now on the right side, you can see a picture of another child who 
how their brain looks after 20 minutes of walking. The, uh, as you can see, there is more neural activity there. And there is also I want to share this image with you here. These are the neural networks that form inside the brain. On the left image, you can see what it looks like before training. After training takes place, the middle one is what it looks like after two weeks. And the one on the far right is what it looks like two months after so what the CDC found was these physiological changes were often associated with improved attention, improved information processing, enhanced coping, enhanced positive effect, and reduced sensations of craving and pain. And there is also another correlation between increased exercise and sleep. When you exercise more, you get a better night's sleep. Now sleep has another effect on your brain and memories. You see, there was a study done where they were looking at people who were sleeping and during sleep, during your deep sleep, they found that there were these waves, these going across the brain. And what they discovered was, at first, when you're awake, those brain waves, it, it would be like you're in a football stadium and you're hearing everybody having these individualized conversations all day because you're, you're processing all this information around you. So when you go to sleep, all of a sudden, it's like those brain waves, they begin to chant, like in the football stadium. And it's going from, the front of your brain to the back where the hippocampus is, what it is doing, they discovered, is taking everything that happened in your, to you during that day and consolidating it in the back of your brain. That's why Matthew Walker, who wrote a book on sleep and has studied it extensively, said that he discovered that with a study done with students, that it was far better for those students to have evenly paced out studies over an extended period of time versus trying to cram it all one night because it allowed the time for their brain during sleep to actually process those memories and put them into long-term memories. And part of that turned out to be the uh, two hours were just before you wake up were critical. So when somebody slept six hours, they were cutting off some of the most important parts of their memory consolidation, which happens during sleep. So now we will look at some simple exercises you can do to start today. There are a number of different exercises, of course, but there is only one exercise that really requires no extra equipment, and that is running. Basically, all you need is a shoe, of course, or two shoes, and uh, some people even do it barefoot. So I want you to begin to take a moment to imagine the finish line. You're approaching, or let me back up, you're at the starting line. Imagine that you are at the starting line of a new beginning in your life. You're going to take steps in the positive direction. According to um, positive psychology today, as you begin to exercise, um, it will result in decreased stress and social anxieties and, and improved memory. So begin to imagine those benefits as you come to the starting line of your new race and imagine a revitalized energy and excitement. Now at the starting line, you're going to take small steps. You can start out by walking. Try walking twice a week and then build upon that. Start to run a little more. Take small steps, start slow, but remain consistent 
and you will begin to notice improvement. As you push yourself harder, you will begin to build on that. So I also want you to imagine crossing the finish line. Uh, there was a marathon, marathon, Aaron Garvey, who runs about 30 marathons in the last decade, she described crossing the finish line as joyful, exhilarating, scary, tearful, humbling, prideful. There's a lot of emotions in that. So it may be difficult right now to join a 5K, given the current situation. I would definitely encourage you to consider it when things begin to change. Go to racesonline.com and you can find a cause that you believe in and you support. So set that goal. Start at least walking twice a week and then go to racesonline.com and find a race that appeals to you. So we have looked at how students are facing an epidemic of stress and we have looked at how they can improve their mental vitality through an academic performance, through exercise. And you can start today with the simple exercise of running, which is, of course, universal in its availability to do it. You can go outside and start running today. So start, so start taking small steps. And Finally, to requote Plato, he said, we should not exercise the body without joint assistance of the mind, nor exercise the mind without joint assistance of the body. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Y'all just knocked it out of the park. Good job. Thank you. Okay, so I think that's it. I had somebody not show up, but that's okay. I already sent them an email. So unless y'all have any questions for me, you get to go enjoy the rest of your evening. Great. I've already submitted my outline online. I only Perfect. have to submit the slides. I it while, I, while you were talking. Okay. You upgrade for it. I can do it sometimes. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Um, there other people? Yeah, it's super nice to see all your happy faces. Is there more faces here? There are a few, yeah. You had a bit of an audience. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Yay! And you didn't even know it. No, I didn't. You I just saw you there. Go you. Maybe, maybe that took some of the pressure off of it. Oh, maybe. <laughs> you couldn't see anybody, probably. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot different doing it in person than uh, recording it. Yeah, I'm definitely bummed out about that part. I actually just found out that I'm teaching uh, the nurses section of public speaking next semester with my health comm classes. And it's going to be entirely online again, which I know needs to happen, but I'm still like bummed out about it. Wow, it's uh, great to see fellow students here. Hi. Yeah. Your peers, you're all real. Not just digital. <laughs> Makes it a little easier to get into all the peer evaluations and stuff too, I'm sure. All right. Well, let me know if anything pops up. You have any questions? Um, I'm going to eat something and then I will, if I haven't already put your grade in, um, put your grade in and then send you an email with the feedback from the rubric that I typed up while you were doing your speeches. So you should have that later tonight. I need to like say what it's like on first or do I? Nope, you're just gonna jump straight in with your attention getter. Okay, so um, when I mentioned the words um, college counseling, um, what are some of like the first words that come to your mind? And when I ask most people this, um, their answers are long lines, um, poorly trained counselors, kind of a waste of time and unfortunately that's um, actually pretty true for a lot of college campus counseling centers. Um, so I'm advocating that every college student has access to proper mental health services um, for free 
And um, so many college campuses at the moment do not have the funding or the staffing available to have every student receive the help that they need. So it's important that colleges and universities change this and start to integrate more resources into this topic. So um, I guess between my own like personal kind of experiences and um, learning about this in some of my classes as a psychology major, um, I feel pretty knowledgeable on the topic of counseling as a whole and um, counseling on college campuses. So, um, so, okay. So I guess my first main point. Um, so although um, the like rates of mental illness and mental health issues among college students have um, gradually risen, um, there's still a large number of students not being able to get the help that they deserve. Um, so um, there's a statistic from the Active Minds organization that states that two thirds of college students um, with mental health problems do not seek treatment. And this is partially because they don't have proper treatment to seek in the first place. So um, the 2014 National Survey of College Counseling actually um, stated that 30% of centers report that with some exceptions, they actually limit the amount of counseling sessions students are allotted per year. And um, this is not a uncommon thing. Actually, the University of Memphis itself um, limits your amount of sessions you can get per semester, um, which can leave some students out of sessions and result in them having to go off campus and pay extremely high prices to receive the help that they need, which is wrong. <laughs> um, so um, the number of counseling sessions students are allowed, um, that's 30% too many. So there's shouldn't be any college campuses that are allowed to um, stop students' services after an allotted amount of time and start charging them. Um, so in a psychological services journal entry, um, it was stated that 96% of college campuses um, most common problem was um, not enough employees, so lack of staffing. So that's one of the second um, big issues is the lack of um, employees that they have um, without proper employees, properly trained employees. Um, you're gonna see a lot of students having extreme long wait times and um, not being able to get in in a timely manner. So um, a solution to this problem is increasing the funding um, for the services as well as um, increasing the amount of staffing um, to help students get proper training. So um, since some of the largest issues around it are um, the staffing and the funding, I feel like those are the first two things that should be addressed for um, college students um, and for college campuses. So I feel like that's the first place to start. Um, so um, in a 2017 APA journal entry, which is the American Psychological Association, um, the authors wrote that Advocating for increased staffing to meet the minimum staffing recommendations of the International Accreditation of Counseling Services is vital. So there's um, guidelines from these accredited associations and too many college campuses are not following these guidelines. So unless those guidelines are being properly implemented and um, used throughout campuses, there is going to be a lack of funding and staffing. 
Um, also in an article from Higher Education Policy, the authors focused on providing proper financial support for the services and keeping them in-house, meaning that your tuition that you already have to pay covers all of your um, mental health services rather than charging students on top of their already um, high tuition. So um, colleges must increase uh, the funding of counseling services to make sure that they are um, they have the proper resources they need and to make sure that every single student gets the help that they need. Um, so by investing more money and effort into these programs, the crisis, the student mental health crisis on college campuses could greatly decrease, which is a really promising vision. Um, it's gotten so it's increased so much in the past couple of years and um, you can see in the chart on my PowerPoint um, from 2008 to 2017, the numbers of students experiencing anxiety and the difficulties to even function, um, it's greatly increased from 2008 to 2017 and um, and so um, with the increasing levels of issues, um, campuses have to accommodate to these. So college campuses, um, they remain relatively the same throughout the years with funding and staff, um, but with the numbers growing consistently, these campuses have to learn to accommodate and change things. They can't keep these same practices from like 2008 when we have such higher numbers today of students needing help. So um, if every student had access to reliable um, counseling, the rates for mental health problems and suicide would likely decrease, um, which is obviously great for college students um, and for society as a whole. Um, so for students who are struggling to be able to receive um, high quality counseling, that would greatly change the entire environment of college campuses. Um, it would create a much safer and happier environment for all the students. And um, there would be a lot less, the statistics on college suicide rates and self-harm rates would likely decrease as well, um, which are two things that college campuses have to take with extreme caution and importance. Um, so in a 2017 entry uh, from the Journal of College Student Psychotherapy, which is a journal focusing largely on college students and their therapy and counseling, um, the author writes um, of the comprehensive Comprehensive Counseling Center model, which is a model used to um, kind of as a basis for all counseling centers. Um, so he writes, and I quote, um, the CCC promotes a vision for campus psychological wellness, drawing upper administration and other campus leaders into conversation and advocacy for mental health awareness, destigmatization, early intervention and prevention. So these um, guidelines are extremely important and can completely reshape um, the way that college campuses run their counseling centers and um, make it more accessible to all students, especially students who um, are in minorities who need extra counseling, um, things like that. So to keep it open to absolutely everybody. Um, so. Currently, as I've stated, there are many colleges lacking in proper mental health resources. Um, so necessary change is clearly needed to accommodate to all these students. So um, all college students should have access to the proper mental health services. Um, so I encourage everyone as college students yourselves to um, support campus counseling services and to advocate for a change in these. Um, if you know, you're a college student yourself, um, 
this is kind of like our society, it's very important that we support each other and we support these organizations. Um, and gradually through this support and these changes, um, you'll see a large decrease in the amount of students struggling with their mental health. So um, again, every single college student deserves to um, receive the help that they need when in crisis or when dealing with anxiety or depression, any of the um, common mental health problems that college students have. Um, it's our job just as students and as people to support these services and to make sure that college campuses um, are in line with what is necessary for students. So that is all. They couldn't see their faces or anything and they were like, I didn't yeah. know people were here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, now that we've got that up here, I've got your, no, this is not your outline. I'm gonna go get your outline. I've got your rubric all up, I've got your PowerPoint. Okay, so there you are. I feel like everybody did MMS and it makes me so happy. <laughs> it's my favorite. I think it's the most effective. At least for action speeches. Mm -hmm. All right. This, 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 your face. I got it all. I'm ready when you are. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and start then. Um, so I did mine on why the minimum wage should be increased. Um, the federal minimum wage is a controversial topic that is widely discussed and has been relevant to the working class and beyond for many years. There are several advocates and critics who are for or against um, the federal minimum wage being increased. The federal minimum wage was last raised on July 24, 2009, when it rose from 6.25 an hour to 7.25, the last step of an increase approved by Congress in 2007. Before 2007, the minimum wage had been stuck at 5.15 per hour for 10 years. And we are back in that same predicament as we haven't had another increase in 11 years. Furthermore, there are a lot of points to be taken into consideration when, taking, when talking about a proposed increase, which includes businesses, the labor market, and the employees themselves. Employees deserve a living wage to meet life's basic needs, like food and shelter. The average minimum wage worker would have to work 97 hours a week to even be able to afford a standard two-bedroom apartment. Those numbers of hours are more double the typical work week of average Americans, which is around 40 hours. Minimum wage increase would encourage customer spending, thus stimulating the economy, which would lead to more jobs as businesses would have to level up with the demand. Lastly, businesses would benefit from the minimum wage increase in multiple aspects. With, minimum, with employees making more money, it would decrease turnover, which will ultimately have businesses save more money on um, the hiring and training process. So in this speech, I will discuss why the federal minimum wage should be increased. First, employees deserve a minimum or a living wage to meet life's basic needs like food and shelter. There have been many advocates for the 5 for 15 campaign that is still being rallied around today. Whether you agree with the federal minimum wage being increased that much or not, you should be able to see why 725, the current minimum wage, is not ideal to meet the needs of the average American. There are two main options considered for the minimum wage increase that aren't $15. Both are $9 and then the $10.10 10 .10 option. For the $9 option, roughly 7.6 million workers who will earn that per hour under current law would have higher earnings during the average week if the option was implemented. And those who make more than that would see an increase in income as well. CBO 2014, page three. This would raise the real income of the average family by millions of dollars overall and could help pull some families above the federal poverty fresh threshold. But it is often brought up that the increase to bring less hours and cut back employment a significant amount a study was done on the fluctuation between employment and hours against the minimum wage, and they found that individual level data uh, show that people who are likely affected by minimum wage increases do not experience a significant decline in hours related or relative to those unaffected. Zavadny, 2000, page 748. For the 1010 option, these numbers are slightly higher. As stated previously, the average minimum wage worker would have to work 97 hours a week to even afford a standard two bedroom apartment. 
full-time minimum wage workers cannot afford a one-bedroom apartment in 95% of the United States, Iran 2020, page four. The cost of living, of course, varies from state to state, but overall, the cost of living has gone up significantly, while the minimum wage remains the same at 725 for the last 11 years. We're due for an increase, as over the past 11 years, cost of living and prices of basic needs in general have been increasing annually. Secondly, a minimum wage increase would encourage customer spending and stimulate the economy. With more money in workers' pockets, they are encouraged to spend more, which would elevate the economy. In turn, this would lead to more jobs being created to level out with the demand for businesses. One of the most rigorous studies was done by the researchers of University of California at Berkeley, who compared income levels among pairs of neighboring United States counties that had differing minimum wage levels between the years of 1990 and 2006. In 2005, Spokane County, Washington had a minimum wage of $7.35 an hour, while the neighboring county of Kootenay County, Idaho, had a minimum wage of $5.15. Looking at the restaurant industry, who usually hires low-wage workers, um, the researchers studied every county pair with differing minimum wage levels over the course of the entire 16-year period and found that higher minimum wages do not increase employment rates around 2010. Bearing this in mind, raising the federal minimum wage could only help the economy instead of harm it because raising it would allow people to spend more money. If the minimum wage was increased according to um, inf inflation, a topic most people bring up when discussing raising the minimum wage, it would be $10.76, not $7.25. Cooper 2013. The labor, market is, the labor market is also extremely important to consider when discussing the minimum wage. It comes down to supplying a skill that someone demands, which can range from the food industry to a chief executive officer of a major company. The supply of labor depends on the number of people that are qualified to do the job, but this does not discount the fact that people need um, to be making a living wage and so that they can spend more in their economy. And then lastly, businesses would benefit from the minimum wage increase in multiple aspects. Higher wages lead to less turnover, which means Businesses can save more money on the hiring and training process if they have more employees sticking around. If businesses are investing in their employees, overall productivity would increase and in turn help the business a um, significant amount. Particularly in fast food where the minimum wage affects workers greatly, there is a high turnover rate for an industry that is in high demand. If the minimum wage had grown at the same rate as productivity, it would be up to $18.30 today and close to $19 an hour by 2016. Cooper 2013. This statistic shows that businesses would be saving a lot of money with a modest increase to either $9 an hour or the 10 or $10.10 .10 option. Passing a bigger phased in minimum wage increase will give low paying businesses time to adjust and experience varied benefits of higher wages like increased customer spending, lower staff turnover, increased productivity and more satisfied customers, which are all benefits for any company, big or small. Musgrave 2016. Overall, businesses would actually be saving more money instead of losing money, which is um, the main point that people bring up in discussing raising the minimum wage. If they invest in their employees, and the employees would do the same in return. In conclusion, the minimum wage should be increased. Employees deserve a living wage to meet life's basic needs. The minimum wage would increase and encourage customer spending and overall stimulate the economy. Minimum wage increase would not hurt businesses, and they would actually benefit from the increase. Taking into consideration the good that can come from the minimum wage increase, like encouraging customer spending, stimulating the economy, and decreasing turnover, this country would benefit from minimum wage increase overall. It is important to know that the working class, especially those who work for the minimum wage, usually have to juggle multiple jobs to make ends meet and to make the money they need um, due to the low unsustainable minimum wage just to meet life basic needs. But with the increase, America's working class would be far better off. Yay, thank you. <laughs> the head football coach, Nick Saban, signed an $8.3 million deal, which will actually make something around $9 million, according to USA Today. And then not long after that, uh, Clemson's coach, Dabo Sweeney, signed a contract worth almost $9.5 million. So obviously these sports are uh, super important to these universities if they're paying their coaches almost $10 million. Uh, NBC News broke a story about a James Madison University student who during a class project, she found out that the university made her pay over $2,000 in hidden tuition fees for their sports programs. Uh, and the only way she was able to find out about this was by searching the university's webpage because it didn't even show up on her tuition bill. 
is, is crazy. That makes no sense. Uh, one more glaring example of universities valuing money over education is the recent Varsity Blues scandal, where over 30 parents were arrested for uh, bribing schools for their children's admission. Most notable of these being Lori Laughlin and Felicity Huffman. It's estimated that those 30 parents paid a combined $25 million to get their children admitted into these elite schools. Well, how long has this been happening? Why is our tuition so high if these celebrities donate these mass amounts of money to get their children uh, admitted? This needs to change, and it starts within the universities themselves. I love sports probably more than the next guy, but I don't love them as much as the debt that I have. Nick Saban's $8 million contract shouldn't have come from my tuition without my permission. The tuition funds need to be allocated better and there needs to be a whole lot more transparency. Also, the board members of universities, they need to be comprised of individuals who are familiar with the day-to-day -day operations of the university, rather than these wealthy al alumni who really have no business as board members when that just promotes greed and corruption. <coughs> Uh, finally, these universities need to protect their students. We should never feel unsafe in any educational setting, let alone one that we pay $20,000 a year for. But we need to feel like we're part of a family or a learning community, not just a number. Apart from the universities themselves, uh, the government can step in. Universities rely on subsidies from the government based on federal student aid programs. According to Forbes, um, <clears throat> 88 percent of for-profit institutions get more than half the revenues from the government. If university students nationwide could speak up and rally about these issues, I believe the university system would be able to reform. College needs to be more affordable for all students. We shouldn't be left in doubt, excuse me, we shouldn't be left in debt with, uh, with entry-level jobs. We shouldn't have to wonder if our peers worked to get their admissions or if they bought it. And we certainly shouldn't have to feel unprotected while we're at campus. I'd love to live in a world where I know my child is safe when he or she moves away to go to school. I want them to live in a world where they're part of a community that encourages educational success uh, rather than just looking at them as a number. Thank you. Hi, Ms. Brockman and everyone watching, if anyone was here. Uh, today I'm continuing my fight um, to end impaired driving. So impaired driving is a problem in society, but there are simple steps that we can take to change the deadly outcomes and consequences if we take action. Um, the Missouri, Missouri University Healthcare also stated that an estimated 32% of fatal car crashes uh, involve an intoxicated driver or a pedestrian. These statistics are jaw-dropping and very shocking. According to MAD and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, 28 individuals in the United States die every day um, in drunk driving accidents. This means that someone dies every 51 minutes because someone drove under the influence of alcohol. Impaired driving is, an, is awful because of the consequences it causes, causes and the deadly and life-altering changes. This is irrelevant in society today, more than we wish, but it can easily be avoided if we take the right course of action as a community and as a nation. So today I'm going to be touching on the topic of three solutions within our grasp when it comes to avoiding and stopping impaired driving. So the first solution is rideshare programs, such as Uber, Lyft, and having a designated driver. Uber and MAD announced a campaign to eliminate drunk driving. Drunk driving is still the number one killer in our nation's roads. And there is no excuse for this, said MAD National President Colleen Shishi Shihei. Church, I'm not really sure how to say her name. <laughs> um, but with all the options available for a non-drinking designated driver, everyone must take personal responsibility for keeping our roads free of the devastation caused by drunk driving. So this is where apps like Uber um, come in and save the day when people decide to go out and drink but have um, a safe option home. Lyft is also another one of these rideshare programs um, and they stated that 88% of Lyft riders um, have reported that they ride to avoid driving under the influence. And a study showed that the availability of ride sharing can reduce the alcohol related driving risk from up to 51%, which is huge, and OWI deaths by more than 10%. Uh, so Tyler George, who is a Lyft New England general manager, also stated that as a company, 
We are excited to support this important um, effort to help ensure that the Massachusetts residents who are under the influence of marijuana are not driving um, and have access to a responsible ride home. So this addresses marijuana as another type of drug um, found on the roads causing impairments and deaths. So they're not just talking about alcohol, which is also super important because marijuana is also, now that it is legal in certain states and from Canada where I'm from, it's legal across the country now. So it's important that people are addressing this issue as well. Uh, and so I believe that ride chairs are the future of a safer community and with their dedication to keeping the roads safe, um, uh, there's no excuse for letting yourself or others um, drive under the influence of alcohol or any other drug. The second topic I'm going to talk about is ignition interlock devices. So these are devices that are like a breathalyzer for someone's car. Uh, it's required that the individual to blow into a mouthpiece for the, um, uh, the driver must drive every time before they drive. Uh, this device analyzes the concentration of the blood alcohol content, uh, which then prevents the engine from starting. Um, this device is usually found in the driver's seat and is attached to the ignition system. So Alcalock Al Al USA um, announced that MAD is pushing for all states to require the devices for all DUI and w DWI offenses. Uh, including all first offenses. So as of 2019, 32 states and Washington DC have an all offender requirement. So anyone arrested with a blood alcohol content above 0 0.08 um, must have an ignition interlock device installed in their vehicle in order for them to get their full driving privilege back. They also stated that these have been a part in, um, have been seen in the U US since 1986 when the state of California started a pilot program. And due to the success of this, um, they have expanded across the whole um, state of California. And according to MAD, uh, ignition interlock devices have stopped more than 2.3 million people from driving drunk since 2006, which you can imagine how many deaths that they've prevented with this device. And so I also have a video that I'd like to share about these ignition interlock devices. I was going out every every week and uh, having some beer and, and wine. I was always asking myself, am I okay to drive? <laughs> they didn't know. People think they know, but they don't actually know. But more and more people are choosing to learn and to educate themselves. Alcohol countermeasure systems uh, began as a research division with the specific task of coming up with a technological solution to prevent drunk driving as it was known in its day. Well, you find a, a group of companies who install our products uh, for the first time. And the guy goes, I've known my drivers for 20 years, and two of them have failed to be able to get their vehicle started. And he figures after six hours sleep, you know, he's going to be good. It takes time for the alcohol to get out of your system. There's no question ACS is really one of the pioneers when it comes to offender-based programs and also uh, ignition interlocks for vehicle manufacturers. And work with a number of law enforcement agencies, traffic safety groups, and, and groups that promote safety, such as Mothers Against Drunk Driving, Traffic Injury Research Foundation, um, and many others. It's a cause behind it all, and that's, it's very good to think about that once in a while. You know, when you get really tired, when you've been working much, it's, 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 in the end, it's something good that we're working for. You actually get the sense that you're part of something big, and that you're doing something credible to help somebody or some people globally. What can we contribute to the society, right? And this is part of the product that uh, have the edge of I believe is part of the uh, solution to the society of the community. Just make the road safer. Plain and simple. So that I included that video because it really like hit close to home with what I'm talking about. So and it, how it shows that you know you might think you know someone and you really don't. Like for truck drivers, they said. I thought I knew my drivers when two of them blew over. So it just shows how effective they are and how they can help society. So my last point is about sobriety checkpoints. So checkpoints are places where officers are set up on a roadway to randomly uh, stop vehicles and to check for impaired drivers. These are usually set up during times when impaired driving is more likely to happen, such as holiday weekends. And so according to James C. Fell, John H. Lacey, and Robert B. Boas, there is substantial and consistent evidence from research that highly 
publicized, um, highly visible and frequent sobriety checkpoints in the United States can reduce impaired driving um, from 18% to 24%. But only about a dozen of these 37 states that conduct checkpoints do so on a weekly basis due to a lack of funds, which is really upsetting in my point of view. Um, but I believe that the government and local states should be putting more money into these programs as they've been proven to decrease the number of impaired driving cases, which ultimately decreases the number of deaths. I believe with more frequent sobriety checkpoints, people who drive impaired more consistently would change their attitudes and their actions. And so all in all, I hope that these three solutions, the, although these three solutions are very easy, yet impaired driving is still the number one killer on our roads. It's my hope that educating ourselves and holding ourselves and each other accountable can one day lead to an impaired free um, society where the blood alcohol tolerance is zero because zero is the number of deaths, victims, drunk drivers, and tragedies we want in our society. Thank you. Yay. We're at eight minutes. Good. Okay, so uh, I will let Clarissa. Okay, so why women, why women should get paid the same as men? Sorry, it wasn't working. Okay, so just imagine you have a job, let's say you work from, let's say, nine to five, and you even put in some extra work. So you'll either go in early to work, or you stay later, or even bring work home. So now with all that extra work and commitment that you've done, um, maybe it could be the same as some of your colleagues or more, but you still don't get paid the same just because you're a woman. Now take that in, and how would that make you feel? Well, now you know how many women feel across um, the world. In a world all about money, it's completely male-dominated world. I'm sure you've heard about how men get paid more than women. There are many debates, there are some speeches, arguments about this topic. So in 2018, the IWPR uh, says that a full-time female year-round worker will make 82 cents for every dollar a man will earn. And that's a gender wage gap of 18%. And also the IWPR analysis of women and men earnings over 15 years found that women made just half of what men earned. So that's 49%. Now those statistics are more for like basic jobs or anything, but there's also uh, women in sports that feel the same way about unequal pay. Female athletes are entitled to equal pay. They are working just as hard as their male counterparts to achieve their goals, but they're getting paid less. This does not only apply to athletes, but it's all women that should be getting um, equal pay. So now a little bit of a background. Uh, the women's sports history says if we go back in time to the 19th century, uh, American, wh American white women were frowned upon sports because they believed it was a threat to females fertility. But there's also a few sporting outlets for poor women who had athletic gifts and aspirations. So instead, uh, elite women would elite wealthy women were allowed um, at certain sports like tennis or crochet. Uh, the first time a woman athlete participated in um, the Olympic Games was in the 1900 Olympic Games. That was a big impact for the women's revolution of sports and that actually helped set the bar for women's in the sports industry. Um, so now here's an example of just like an unfairness um, of women versus men in payments in sports. So this example comes from the soccer world. So the US women's soccer team, some of you may or may not know that they won the World Cup back to back and they actually won the tournament four times overall. However, the members of the team would only get $250,000 each as prize money. On the other hand, men national team, which did not even qualify for the World Cup, if they were to uh, win the World Cup, then they'd get 1.1 million each. And this is just one example from one certain sport but this is happening across all sports in all different countries. So in my speech, I'll be addressing an example of how sports organization I represent, uh, that represents them will, will represent with different amounts of money and the organizations that are involved are more success, successful when they get paid equally. I'll also be talking about how women athletes are more successful when they get more sponsorships and advertisements, as well as um, 
I'll be addressing how women will lose their motivation in sports if, they, uh, if there is continuous unequal pay. Although women have faced many challenges throughout history, they have come closer and closer to achieving gender equality, and they will not stop until they do so. So for my first point, organizations that pay athletes equally are more successful. So once again, I'm gonna be using an example from the soccer world. And so the US Soccer Federation is the organization that the men and women um, team, uh, national teams play for. And so in an article in the Washington Post, they use this 20 game scenario, but it's like a hypothetical, if both teams were to play 20 games, what would happen kind of thing. So it says in the article that they calculated the player on the women's team and it would, they would earn $28,000, $333 less than what a man would on the men's team. If both the teams were to lose all 20 games and the players would make the same amount. And that's only because men earn a $5,000 bonus compared to women that have a base salary. Now the US women's soccer team is considered to be one of the best women's soccer team in the last decade. Um, they have a close earning with the men's team and they found, or, and they are one of the few teams that fought for their earnings and they get paid decent compared to other countries and they've been winning uh, the World Cup back to back. So talking about the World Cup, um, the New York Times actually asked a dozen of the women players um, from different countries how much they earn. And several of the Jamaicans have said that uh, they, their range is from either zero dollars to a few hundred. And then there's other players from, let's say, Thailand, South Africa, Nigeria, Argentina. They say they make either $5,000 annually or um, less from soccer. So the U.S. soccer team gets paid the most, and they are the best team in the women's soccer world currently. Um, but this is not only just for soccer. There are, of course, other sports experiencing the exact same thing. Now, women athletes are more successful when they get more sponsorships and advertisements is the next uh, main point. Media does not give women's sports much coverage. There is less than 10% of sports media co that covers women's sports, and even less than 2% of the media covers women's sports that are considered to be masculine. So even in the Olympic games, the display of unequal coverage throughout the networks. So for example, the US women's basketball team won their fifth consecutive gold medal in 2012, but received less than half of a, a minute in primetime coverage, whereas the men team that won uh, their second consecutive uh, gold medal on, uh, get, got approximately a half an hour of primetime coverage. So the, although the 2012 Olympic Games for the first time ever actually provided more coverage in the women's sports than men's on NBC, but the coverage was only for women's sports that was considered more like feminine type of sports. So you have like gymnastics or like figure skating. Um, with that misrepresentation of women's sports, um, it's been argued to be responsible for the lack of interest in women's sports from the sports fans. This lack of coverage of women's sports may be holding sport fans uh, back from actually developing more interest in the women's sports in general. And an example of that again is the women's soccer. There's um, a, been a lot of media around the World Cup and actually just in 2019, it was the first time that there was so many viewers and there was 1.1 billion people watching. So there has been more um, media on that. Now, women athletes are going to have a loss for motivation in sports with um, such an inequality of payment. So there is less of an opportunity. And when there's actually an opportunity, there's a lack of equality in the reward for the work. This is where the biggest chance uh, to turn their disparities around lies. Although girls and women in many societies There you go. Um, and so sorry, although girls and women's in many societies with greatly will greatly participate in different sports, they have been traditionally underrepresented compared to boys and men. So that underrepresentation generally reflects more of a lesser interest in playing sports or um, fewer opportunities in order uh, for engagement in sports. Now, women put in a lot of work just like men, and women have to work harder because they're, they're trying to prove a point to everyone. But there's female athletes that 
boost other female athletes just to break some, the certain stereotype and they even go harder than ever because that they're trying to prove a point they're giving it their all and at the same time they're trying to prove a point that they deserve equality and to get the credit that the, any man would now despite the improvements towards reaching the gender equality in sports female athletes still have numerous obstacles they don't get paid the same as men even though they even though they achieve the same as them or even more women have also less media coverage so it's difficult to get more people interested in it and it finally the lack of equality it, when there's a lack of equality there's also a lack of motivation for the young girls and women in sports they have dreams and desires on athletics so why can't we treat pay the same for women and men women deserve a lot more than what they get and for a long time women have been scandaled with the pay in sports and even jobs. Girls and women are constantly told that they can't do what boys can because uh, when it comes to sports. Now, women rights in the sports industry has progressed. Um, they have progressed, but there are still many obstacles because of the inequality of treatment and pay. Now, women are strong and talented and they put in the same amount of work at the same amount of work in and they sacrifice the same things as any other professional athlete would. And they should be getting paid way more for all the stuff that they put into just like men. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Exactly 10 minutes. Ooh, that was lucky. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so like you said, or like you heard me say to Claire, you should get some feedback hopefully today. Um, that's my plan, at least. I'm gonna take a little break and then get back into it, but keep an eye on your email. But you'll get um, a grade any courseware and then you'll get an email with the feedback. Okay, perfect, thank you. Really good speeches, good job. Thank you. <laughs> Good job, Clarissa. Thanks, Claire. <laughs> Let me know if y'all have any questions or anything. Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay. It is, but you also want to click. Um, there we go. There it is. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I am ready whenever you are. Okay. Um, I'm doing my persuasive speech on paternity leave and why I think it's important for fathers to take paternity leave. You can ask any parent, including myself, that a baby ranks one of the best milestones in your life. Most would tell you that the birth of a child is one of that, but most important is the birth of a baby or an adoption of a baby. 
And those first few weeks following birth are crucial for parent baby bonding from midnight cuddle section sessions to baby's first laugh, baby's first walk steps, first crawl, rollovers. But moms and dads need that time with baby to hone their new parent skills from feedings to diaper changes and everything in between. Paternal leave is what makes it possible to learn these skills firsthand. And research has shown that dads who take it are more likely to be involved in parenting for the long run and experience plenty of benefits from a healthier heart to a longer life and better relationship with their partners. Although paid paternity leave is often framed as an issue that matters to working women, paid paternal leave is also critical and important for fathers. Policies are to ensure fathers have the support they need to prioritize their family responsibilities while also meeting work demands and can significantly increase the personal and economic well-being of our families. Paternity leave and especially longer leaves of several weeks or months can promote parent-child bonding, improve outcomes for children, and increase gender equality at home and at the workplace. Longer paternity leaves are associated with increased engagement, leads to improved health and developmental outcomes for children. We also know that when fathers are more engaged with their children, their children have better developmental outcomes. This includes fewer behavior problems and improved cognitive and mental health outcomes. A study of our four OECD countries, including the United States, found evidence suggesting that longer paternity leaves and increased time fathers spent caring for their very young children is associated with higher cognitive test scores for their children and increased father engagement and bonder over longer periods of time. Increased engagement can lead to improved health and developmental outcomes for children. We also know that when fathers are more engaged with their children, their children have better developmental outcomes. Uh, we also know that if fathers are more engaged with their children, they have better developmental outcomes, improved cognitive and mental health outcomes, and it spend longer time with their children over the course of their child's life, helping them succeed in life. Paternity leave can reduce work family conflict for fathers. Fathers are increasingly concerned about work life balance and nearly half of men surveyed that the demands of work interfere with the family life. Paid leave makes it easier for fathers like mothers to better balance their responsibilities at home, make them wanna come home earlier to see their children and their better outcome, produce better outcome at work. Similarly, relationship conflict has important implications for couples and children. For example, high levels of conflict between partners and negative communication during conflict is associated with a higher risk of divorce or separation. Relationship conflict between parents is also associated with lower well-being among children. Thus, it is also important to consider factors that may help to promote parental relationship quality. Paternity leave taking may also help to facilitate, facilitate stronger paternal relationships, similar to the idea that fathers may use the time off provided by paternity leave to focus on the relationship with their new child, their partners, and their families. Following childbirth, it's important to set aside quality time with your partner and also help out with the occasional household chores and enjoy different activities with your partners, showing your children that you're able to step in and take over the role if the partner or the spouse is sick or is in need of taking care of the other child, the, the new additional child, and mm -hmm. try to get outdoors together with you and, your, and the baby as much as possible to help you and your partner out. All benefits of taking paternity leave. And thank you, that's it. I don't know if there was six minutes.